Hello, this is Jake Abbott, and today we're going to be talking about functions of a square matrix. <clears throat> There's a lot of math that you can do on square matrices that you can't do on matrices in general, and um, those, those mathematical tools are going to be really important to us in analysis of state space systems. So let's begin with some really simple matrix math for square matrices. So let's say I have a matrix A, and let's just take a little 2x2 matrix of some constant A, B, C, and D, like this. Now, this idea of A squared is something that's really well established, and it's sort of obvious how you would, you would do that. You would just multiply A, B, C, D times A, B, C, D. But um, the one thing that maybe isn't completely obvious until you write it out like this and start doing the multiplication is what a squared is not equal to, is it's not equal to a squared, little b squared, little c squared, like this. So <clears throat> this may be kind of obvious actually in this case that, yeah, the way when I say a squared, what I really mean is I'm multiplying a by a. And we could do that, you know, a to the k power, or if, if it were, you know, if it were a cubed, you'd say, well, that's just a times a times a, and you multiply these one at a time. And just, just even beginning to look at this a squared as a really simple function, you start seeing why we're talking about square matrices here. Because in general, if, if a is not a square matrix, you can't multiply it by itself because the inner and outer dimensions won't match up. So this sort of thing only makes sense for square matrices. So we see that when we're talking about at least the simple function of multiplying matrices by each other, the way we do it is we just explicitly write out the matrices and multiply them. We don't do term by term multiplication. It does turn out, though, that if a is equal to a diagonal matrix, so let's say this was a zero term here and here, so you just had a like this, then when you do the, the, all the term by term multiplication, you see that a squared does equal the little, little a squared and little b squared. And it turns out that's actually not true of not only diagonal matrices, but block diagonal matrices. So if A was equal to some some little matrix A1 here and some other matrix A2 here, and they're all zero matrices here, so we had some block diagonal matrix. They don't even all have to be the same. I mean, this could be like a 2 by 2 matrix, and this could be a 3 by 3 matrix. They're all square, but by saying block diagonal, it, it means that you're only looking at square. Then, then in this case, the block diagonal matrices, it's also the case that you can multiply the individual blocks by themselves. And the individual and the individual blocks um, get multiplied back up to the traditional, write them out, and multiply them by each other. So, that's how um, multiplying, just doing a squaring operation, a cubing operations work. It turns out for more general functions. So let's say that we have some function of x, and it's a polynomial of x. So let's say f of x is equal to x squared plus two <coughs> x plus three. Some polynomial of x where you have x to a bunch of powers of itself. And this sort of function, a function that's a polynomial of x, is also defined for square matrices. So I can feed that same function of square matrix as its input, and then you just plug in the matrix in every place that the original variable was. Now, of course, I have to stick my identity matrix here because I can't multiply the number. I can't just add the number three in general to a matrix. So this is the way that this translates. But because we know how to take a to any power, it's pretty obvious that a polynomial function of x is sort of well defined in this way. And then the same thing goes for block diagonal matrices. matrices. So let's say I again have A as a block diagonal matrix. So there's one block there, and there's one block there. <coughs> and I want to take this function f of A. Well, that ends up being I can take the functions of the individual blocks like this. And they're all going to have the same dimension. So the function of the matrix has the same dimension as the matrix. And you can see that here, if A is an n by n thing, then f of A is also an n by n thing. And I'm adding a bunch of n by n matrices together. So these sort of functions of polynomials are defined for matrices. And you can uh, easily prove these to yourself if you want to just work through some simple examples. So. We've been talking about similarity transformations uh, in earlier videos, and let's remind ourselves what we meant when we said that we were doing similarity transformations. We said that I can find some matrix A tilde that's similar to a matrix A using some similarity transformation like this. And um, because of the way that Q is invertible, we have that I can also write this as Q A tilde Q inverse equals A, and these are sort of equivalent statements because of the way Q is invertible. So what happens if I look now at A squared? Well, A squared, I'm just going to plug in this for A squared. So I'm going to get Q A tilde Q inverse for the first A, and then Q A tilde Q inverse for the second A. And then I acknowledge that these two in the middle are just the identity matrix and multiplying things by the identity matrix, so I'll change them. So it's like this just disappears. And so then I'm left with Q, A tilde, A tilde, Q inverse. But that's just equal to Q, A tilde squared, Q inverse. And so I say that A squared is Q, A tilde squared, Q inverse. And if I would have said what's A to the fifth, I would have gotten Q, A tilde to the fifth, Q inverse. So if I want to do similarity transformations, I can basically, I don't have to raise the Qs to the, to the power, only the, the A's in the middle, because this will keep happening over and over, that'll get Q inverse times Q, and those will drop off. And all you're left with is a Q and a Q inverse on the outside. So this, this equation works for any number k, a to the k power. And it also turns out, using the same um, sort of function math as before, it turns out that if you want to have some function of a, and uh, that's going to equal q times the function of a tilde, q inverse. And this is completely equivalent to saying that the function of a tilde is equal to q inverse function of a, q. And, and you can also easily prove this to yourself that this is true, using the same sort of uh, proof that we just did above here. So there's an interesting um, thing you can do for square matrices to a really powerful theorem to use when you're trying to prove yourself um, different properties mathematically, and it's called the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. And the Cayley-Hamilton theorem uh, looks like this. So if we have some matrix A, and it's an n by n square matrix, that we've been talking about its characteristic polynomial. And its characteristic polynomial, you just take the determinant of lambda i minus a, oops, sorry, equals the determinant of lambda i minus a, and you can also say a minus lambda i, it doesn't matter. And you set that thing equal to zero. This is the characteristic polynomial. And that characteristic polynomial always has this sort of shape. It looks like I have, it's an, it's an n-order polynomial in lambda. So I'll have lambda to the n plus some alpha, which is just some scalar constant, times lambda to the n minus one power. And then I'll have a bunch of additional terms. And then I'll eventually get to alpha n minus one, lambda plus alpha n. So I have an n-order polynomial in lambda, and I need n coefficients alpha to describe this, this polynomial. And that's equal to zero. So we call this the characteristic, the char characteristic polynomial or characteristic equation of this n by n matrix A. Well, what the Cayley Hamilton theorem says is it says if I take this polynomial as a scalar and I plug in the matrix itself into this function, so I have this uh, delta A like this, so I'm just plugging in this matrix in each spot. So I'll have alpha 1, A to the n minus 1, alpha n minus 1, A, and then I have to have an identity matrix here, n by n identity matrix, uh, just to make the dimensions match up. This is also satisfied. 
And and the way that you can remember the Cayley Hamilton theorem, and it's often said as, a, as an English sentence, you know, you hardly have to remember the mathematical proof. The way people talk about the Cayley Hamilton theorem is they say a matrix A satisfies its own characteristic polynomial. Meaning, if you take A, solve for its characteristic polynomial, and plug A into the characteristic polynomial, it actually will equal zero. So a matrix A satisfies its own characteristic polynomial. So that's the Cayley Hamilton theorem. So we've been talking about uh, these kind of simple polynomials and saying square matrices satisfy these simple polynomials. But it turns out that lots of other functions that aren't at first obvious how you would solve them um, with matrices are also solved. And so, for example, one is a, is a sine function. So if I have sine of x, it isn't obvious necessarily how you would solve for sine of a. So let's say a again looks like little a, little b, little c, little d. And, and sort of a naive solution would say, what is sine of the matrix a? Well, we know how to do sine sines of scalars, or at least you know how to plug them in your calculator. I mean, sometimes if, um, if pressed, if you have a calculator and I said about the sine of 7, I'm not sure you know you can necessarily sign, uh, solve for it. So a naive assumption say, well, at least I sort of know how to the science of scalars, so I'll do something like this. But based on based on our discussions earlier about how you would do a squared, I think it's sort of you know probably pretty safe to say that's not true. It isn't true. This isn't the way you properly solve for sine. So how is sine solved? Well, sine is solved by going back to a Taylor series approximation for sine of x. So sine of x, if you remember, looks like x minus x cubed over three factorial plus x to the fifth over five factorial minus x to the seventh over seven factorial, and this goes on to infinity, where you're alternating like this. So once you realize that sine is a function that's written like this as some sort of polynomial, and you say, oh, okay, I've seen this before, and I know that polynomial like this, I can just plug in a. So this is the way, this is the way that you would solve for sine of a, is you would solve it using Taylor series approximation, a minus a cubed over three factorial, dot, dot, dot. So you're just gonna plug in a right into this function. And it turns out there are other functions that this works for as well. So for instance, cosine of x, what's its series approximation? One minus x squared over two factorial, plus x to the fourth over four factorial, minus x to the sixth over six factorial, plus dot, dot, dot. Another common function, and probably the most important function for our purposes, is an exponential function, e to the x. It looks like 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus dot dot dot. The exponential function series is the easiest to remember because there's no oscillations, there's no missing terms, it's a very kind of simple expression. So it turns out that any series, so the question is sort of what functions, what scalar functions could you use also for square matrices? And it turns out that any convergent series is one that has that has a square matrix version of it. So what does a convergent series mean? What that means is, as I look at the terms in my in my series, so in the exponential, my terms are 1, and x, and x squared over 2 factorial, as you go along, and so if this is sort of the number of terms, so I'm on the first term, or the second term, or the third term, there's some there's some value, and that value is sort of arbitrary, but what it means is that each with each step, you're getting closer to, to this value. You're never getting farther away from it. And you can just get closer to it slowly, and it may take infinite terms to get all the way there. Um, but you're getting closer. And it's also okay if it, if it oscillates, as long as it's getting closer. So if I start here, and the next time I'm here, and the next time I'm here, and the next time I'm here, that's okay because each one is closer to the eventual value than the one before it. So you're converging on the series. So, um, and so often this value of this dotted line is zero, so each term is getting successively smaller, but it doesn't have to be zero to be conversion. So any series that looks like this and does convert, you can use it for a square matrix approximation as well. And um, let's continue to talk about the, the matrix exponential because that's going to be the most important to us. So we already saw that if A is a block diagonal matrix, so A looks like A1. A2, 0, 0, where these A1 and A2 are themselves little squares matrices. Then we saw how you handle this for general function. So let's just explicitly say e to the A, if A is block diagonal, does in fact look like e to the A1 here and e to the A2 here. This is true of all of these functions, but I just want to write it explicitly for this. So now, we have spent time talking about Jordan block matrices and Jordan 4 matrices. And Jordan 4 matrix is just a block diagonal matrix with a series of Jordan blocks. So let's say that A is a Jordan, uh, let's say A is a Jordan block right now. So it's something like this. I'm going to write a 4 by 4 version because if, when you look at the 4 by 4 version, it's sufficient that you can sort of pick out the pattern and you can do all smaller and bigger ones. So a Jordan block has lambdas on the diagonal, zeros below the diagonal, it's got ones on the super diagonal, and it's got zeros everywhere else. And I can sort of isolate the upper 3 by 3 and that's a 3 by 3 block, here's a 2 by 2 block, here's a 1 by 1 block. It's easy to imagine a 5 by 5 block. So with a 4 by 4, you can really pick out the patterns that you're seeing. So let's say this is our matrix that we're interested in here. And um, just as an exercise, go ahead and try and take a matrix that looks like this, A and squared, and see what happens. I mean, and then, and then take that matrix and times by A again, sort of get A cubed, and see what happens when your blocks get multiplied. What you'll find is that in A squared, you're going to have all zeros down here. You're going to have, for A squared, you're going to have lambda squared, lambda squared, lambda squared, lambda squared on the diagonal. But you'll start getting more and more complicated things up here, like two times lambda or one, and you'll sort of start getting, it looks almost like a series, I and mean, you'll almost start seeing series up here in lambda across here. So, so Jordan blocks have kind of a special form as they get multiplied by each other. So let's say my function now is I'm going to do, I want to look at this function, f of lambda equals e to the lambda t. And you'll sort of recognize this from solutions of differential equations, so it should be surprising that we're talking about this now. And you'll sort of see how it fits into the bigger picture uh, relatively soon. And so we're going to say, can we take this function, which is well-defined uh, in a series expansion, and can we analyze it for, for a matrix case, e to the at? And, and again, this is going back to the fact that we're openly interested in solving matrix equations that look something like this. This is why we're interested in this sort of, this sort of function. So it turns out if you do e to the at, um, and just do it completely explicitly, what you're going to get is something that looks like this. Now remember, I'm looking at this 4 by 4 matrix specifically, and then we can pick up the patterns that fall out of that. So the upper left term looks like e to the lambda t, and in fact we see this e to the lambda t on each of the diagonals. And we get all zeros below the diagonal. And then the superdiagonal row looks like t e to the lambda t. t e to the lambda t. Then the, the diagonal above that row looks like d squared over 2 factorial e to the lambda t. t squared, oh sorry, d squared over 2 factorial e to the lambda t. Then the next diagonal looks like d cubed over 3 factorial e to the lambda t. 
And so I gave you a 4 by 4 Jordan block A, but if that were a 5 by 5 Jordan block, it would be really easy to see what the next entry should be, right? It should be t to the 4th over 4 factorial times t to the lambda t. And if I only gave you 2 by 2 Jordan block, you would just take this upper left 2 by 2. So, so now you sort of have the pattern that any Jordan block of any size, you could take e to the AP of that Jordan block, and you could explicitly solve what it looks like. And because the pattern is so recognizable, you don't ever actually have to do this series math yourself. Once you sort of believe it's true, then you can just sort of memorize this pattern that happens, and you can really quickly pull up the solution of an exponential of Jordan 4 matrix. So, um, what if A instead looks like, let's say A now is a Jordan, uh, a Jordan 4 matrix with two 2 by 2 Jordan blocks. So let's say, I'm going to do something like, oh, sorry, like this. So now this is a Jordan block, so let's say lambda 1, lambda 1, 1, 0. And this is a Jordan block for lambda 2. If I have two 2 by 2 Jordan blocks, and these are just all zeros. So this is a block diagonal matrix with two Jordan blocks. And if I take E to the AT of this thing, you start to see the patterns of how this works itself out. So this block looks like E to the lambda 1, T, E to the lambda 1, T. And then this is D, E to the lambda 1, T, 0 in this block. This is a big zero block here and here. And then this block looks like e to the lambda 2t, e to the lambda 2t, t, e to the lambda 2t, 0. So each of the Jordan blocks individually, when I include them in a function, they just raise exactly like a generic 2 by 2 Jordan block. So now, entire Jordan 4 matrices, with sort of arbitrary Jordan blocks on its main diagonal, you can raise those arbitrary Jordan 4 matrices uh, as an exponent. And so recall that for, um, for any arbitrary matrix A, it is similar to a Jordan form, and we do the similarities like some matrix V, Jordan form matrix V inverse, where this matrix V um, is its columns are what we call generalized eigenvalue or generalized eigenvectors of the matrix A, because this came from this idea that A times V is equal to V times J. So V calls A the generalized eigenvectors of A, and we have the similarity transformation that always, always exists. So any square matrix A, this is true for, and then J is some Jordan form matrix. So knowing what we know about functions of square matrices now, we know that if we raise this function A, we're going to get V times this function J times V inverse. So basically, we now know how, how to take, um, we know how to take E to a Jordan form of D. We've just spent the last slide doing that. So any matrix A, if I want to take E to the AT, I can always write that as V times E to the JT, V inverse. So this is going to be a really powerful tool for us because basically, if I want to raise any matrix A, the exponential any matrix A, I can find its Jordan form using a similarity transformation. Then I can use the pattern that we know about how you take exponentials of Jordan forms. And then at the last step, just pre impose multiply by the V matrix and I'll get the solution. So it's a really nice result for us. Um, Let's kind of wrap up by looking at a couple of other um, nice properties of square matrices that are going to be useful potentially in doing mathematical proofs. So let's begin by sort of writing down what this looks like again in the scalar case. So it looks like 1 plus lambda t plus lambda squared t squared over 2 factorial plus dot dot dot. So you've seen that already. I did e to the x, but now x is lambda t. So now let's explicitly look at that for square matrix and how we might have to change it. Well, now if a is an n by n matrix, and I start with an n by n identity matrix. And typically with, with matrices, you write you multiply the scalar in front of the matrix, so we'll change that to look like that. And the same thing goes for like this. We'll say t squared over 2 factorial times a squared. And so this is how we'll kind of modify this slightly to be a matrix version. So we have this series, and this series is always very well defined. And once you have the series, then you can sort of prove a lot of things to yourself from that series. So for example, if I want to take E to a zero matrix, then I can easily prove to myself that's just the identity matrix. And if I want to take E to the A times T1 plus T2, then this is equal to E to the A T1 times E to the A T2. You can prove that to yourself. You can prove to yourself that E to the A T, if I take this thing, which is if A is an n by n matrix, then E to the A T is also an n by n matrix. And let's say I invert that matrix. That's the same as E to the minus A T. What else can I say? Uh, if, if I want to take the derivative, so the e to the at is still a function of time, so I can take the time derivative of it, so I can take the dt of e to the at. It turns out that that's equal to, and I do this by just going right back up to the series of e to the at and then doing differentiation term by term. And when I do that, and then we pack them, I'll see that this is equal to a e to the at. And an interesting thing that falls out is that's also equal to e to the at times a. So you can pre or post multiply the exponential uh, by a, and you'll get the correct answer. And this is sort of a rare thing that happens with matrices, because usually things don't compute in general. But again, this, this just falls out of differentiating this series up here term by term. Another thing that's interesting, um, sort of one last closing thought, is we have this um, this idea of Laplace transforms of scalars. So when you've seen this before in other courses, the Laplace transform of e to the at looks like 1 over s plus a. Well, if we do term by term Laplace transform of this, we'll find that the Laplace transform of this matrix equation e to the at, where this is an n by n thing, ends up being equal to si minus a inverse, which is the matrix equivalent of this 1 over s plus a. Uh, excuse me, this should have been a lowercase a. So this is the matrix equivalent of this uh, of this scalar equation that you're so familiar with. But again, it just falls out of doing the Laplace transform of this term by term. So I think that the big takeaway from this is everything's done in series. So if you ever want to prove something to yourself, you write out the series of the function you're interested in looking at, whether they be exponentials or sines or polynomials, and you do operations on the series, and then repack things into sort of more compact notation.